Hello everyone and welcome to today's program. My name is Shane Holsgrove. Uh, I'm the Apostolic Overseer uh, of Grace Life Ministries and we're a ministry which focuses in on reaching the unreached, making disciples or strengthening and establishing believers in the truth of God's word, planting and establishing grace communities or churches so that they can do the same. Now we've planted churches in uh, uh, in, in different parts of South Africa. Uh, we've helped plant churches in different parts of Africa. Uh, we've planted a church in Eastern Europe in Duress, and we've helped plant a church in the U.S. And you know, we've been involved in in in, in church planting schools, and that's really our passion and our heart is to work with leaders and equip them, work with them, strengthen them, support them in church planting. And so I want to start off today's program by encouraging you that if you have church planting on your heart, contact us. Uh, you can contact us at admin at gracelife.co and um, just say you're interested in church planting. You heard Shane on GBS and, and you would like to find out more information and we will uh, 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 see how we can connect with you and, um, and uh, strengthen you and train you and, and do what we can to help expand the kingdom. Uh, we are really about God's kingdom business, not about grace life business, but God's kingdom business. So it's a privilege for me to be in your living room, at your business, wherever you are, to be in your company this evening. So thank you for taking the time to listen to this program. I trust that it's a blessing to you. Last week, we were talking about uh, Colossians 2, chapter 10, which says that we are complete in Christ. I'm going to read it actually from the New Living Translation. I love how it puts it. It says, so you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. So this is, this is such a vital truth in Christianity. Such a vital truth. And I can guarantee you, the majority of people, I cannot think of an example where this isn't true. People that I've counseled, people that I've walked with, people that I've discipled, people that are going through crisis. Every single one, every single Christian who I've walked with, counseled, uh, worked with, has uh, uh, been in a position of not, um, how do I put this, not being convinced or aware of their union with Christ. Most people going through a crisis or a tragedy are consumed with the crisis and the tragedy and they're not focused on the reality of their Christianity, the reality of their position in Christ. Christianity is not just something to help us get by in life. Christianity is life. And we need to make sure that we, like we're living from the default reality of our oneness with Him. We're not living for Him, we're living with Him. The Christian life is union with Christ. I want to encourage you to go and open up your Bible to uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and just meditate on the whole of Ephesians. What is meditation? Biblical Christian meditation is filling your mind, not emptying your mind, but focusing on truth, filling your mind with the truth of God, from God's Word. So take the, 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 the truths from uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and go through it line by line and meditate on those things because that, you could, that could radically change your life if you just get some revelation from Ephesians chapter 1. The Holy Spirit wants to teach you things from the Word, but you just need to sit at His feet, sit in His presence and allow those truths to impact your heart. So you also are complete through your union, through your oneness, through your relationship with Him. You are now one with God. That's what Christianity is. The Spirit of God living in man. It's eternal life. It's not just living forever. It's Jesus in you. The Spirit of God in you. And that is what God intended from the beginning of time. To dwell in us. To be one with us. We are complete through our union with Christ. And last week I started talking a bit about these things. And speaking about how uh, uh, we need to see ourselves the way that God sees us. Because what is the most important, the most powerful truth in, in your life right now? What is the, the most powerful truth? It's not what God says about you. It's what you say about you. 
It's not what God believes about you. It's what you believe about you. Because if you don't believe what God believes, it doesn't affect you. It doesn't impact you. So it is so vitally important that you align your thoughts and your heart with what God believes so that you can live the life that he intended you to live. Amen? Yeah, I know that many, many of you watching right now might be facing trials and challenges of many kinds. Salvation isn't supposed to be something which just encourages you through it. It does encourage you through it, but in, in salvation uh, helps you overcome those challenging times. What does overcome mean? It doesn't mean that every single challenge in your life now is fixed, but it means that you overcome by joy. You overcome because you don't allow the, 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 the tragedy, the difficulties, the persecution, the things going on in your life. You're not allowing them to crush you. You're not allowing them to, get to, your, to take your peace away from you. You're not allowing them to steal your joy. Instead, you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, fearing no evil because you know that you know that God is with you. You know that he is one with you. You know that the enemy cannot do anything to you because of your union with him and you're walking with him. Our perspective on Christianity and on our lives and who we are, our identity is so vitally important. It's so vitally important. Look with me. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Hebrews chapter 10, I want to look at a verse there. Yeah. Too many of us as believers are living far below um, what God has intended for us when it comes to Christianity. And I know many, many people who are caught up in the um, false faith circles of name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, whatever you want to kind of call it, where we, we, we feel like we have to say the right thing all the time in order for, for us to live the good life. And, you know, I come from circles like that. I understand circles like that. You know, if, if, if I'm doing a, a, a healing altar call and I say, if you need healing, come forward. A lot of people in the name it, claim it kind of circles of, you know what, brother, I'm healed would maybe uh, 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 come forward, but then say, you know, I've had this. Uh, what can I pray for you for? Oh, nothing. I'm healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. And they'll quote some scripture or whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, then why did you come up in my healing line? I don't want to pray for you if you're healed. I'm here to pray for those that are sick. You know, <clears throat> we, we, we've got to see the reality of our bodies is that sometimes they get sick. We've got the healer, Jesus, living inside of us. And so now... We need to humble ourselves in times of sickness by saying, would you pray for me, brother? Would you pray for me, sister, uh, 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 that I may be healed because I'm experiencing sickness, but I'm believing Jesus for healing. And then what? You allow them to lay hands. You allow them to pray and speak and release healing and life. And then you can receive healing. But we mustn't live in this place of, of saying we have everything right, saying we have everything's going well when we actually need help sometimes. Your life is not going as good as what you say it is. Your life is going as good as your fruit is. And if the fruit isn't going well, then you need to kind of get back to not what are you saying, but what are you believing? Because as a man thinks in his heart, not as a man speaks with his mouth, so is he. You know, Proverbs says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what you believe in your heart is determining the fruit and the life that you live. It's not about what, you, uh, uh, what you're saying with your mouth is directing your life. Now, there is a power of the tongue. I believe that. And I'm not saying that there isn't power in the tongue. But what I am saying is that you need to align your tongue with the word. You need to allow your... Uh, uh, but, but that's not going to bring the right fruitfulness. You need to align your heart with the word. And then your tongue will follow in alignment with the word. And then it's directing your life. You've got to have all three in, in, in check. Your heart needs to be in alignment with God's word. Your tongue needs to be in alignment with God's word. And then you can see fruitfulness flow. But if you're just speaking, if you're just declaring things, but in your heart you don't truly believe them, you might not even have salvation. 
Jesus himself said, many will say, Lord, Lord, have we not in your name cast out demons and done all of these things? And he'll say, I didn't know you. You know, uh, just because you say you're a Christian doesn't mean you necessarily are a Christian. A Christian isn't someone who just confesses Jesus as Lord. Romans chapter nine, uh, uh, sorry, Romans chapter ten, verse nine says that it's heart belief and mouth confession. So our confession lines up with our hearts, and our hearts need to believe the truth, and then we speak the truth, and we see fruitfulness. So the reality of Christianity is that the, the, what God desires every child of God to live in. Every, everybody on the planet, unbelievers too. But obviously, for unbelievers, the first step is believe the gospel. And then for us as believers, we've got to live in believing the gospel. But we, He wants us to enjoy what Christianity is. And yet, the sad truth is, is that so many Christians are not enjoying their Christianity. They're tired of their Christianity. A lot of Christians are tired from trying to be a Christian. I mean, can you imagine that? <laughs> you expect that from the Muslims or something. But you don't expect that from uh, a, a, a Christian being tired from being a Christian. If you're tired from being a Christian, you're not doing it right. <laughs> you're, you're not, you, there's something that you don't believe. That, 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 that There's something wrong in your belief system about your Christian faith. The Christian faith is not an invitation to come and uh, uh, work hard. The, the Christian faith is not an invitation to come in and work, 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 work. Now there is work to be done. We've got a world to reach. But it's not burdensome and it's not tiresome. It'll tire you out, but you won't burn out. But let me, let me read a verse to you. I'll come back to, to Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> but uh, Matthew chapter 11 at the end there from verse 28 to 30. And I want to read from the message translation here. Because I really feel moved by the Spirit that, that this is for, for many of us. Keep in mind, if you are tired because of Christianity, if you're tired because you're trying to please God and live for God, there's something missing. You're doing something wrong. Okay? Uh, th th this is what Jesus says. Again, King James, he says, Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In the... Um, Message translation, he says, are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion, on man's efforts to please and appease God, on man's effort to get closer to God? What does he say then? Jesus says, come to me. Brothers and sisters, the answer for tiredness, the answer for, for being tired from being overburdened by, burdened by religious duty and obligation isn't to do more. <clears throat> And it's not to do less. It's to come to Jesus. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. So many, I know people in ministry, they're, they're burning out. They're, they're tired. Christians, they're, from just living the Christian life, they're tired and they need a holiday. So they, they maybe go away for a, a week or two or a weekend and... They're going to the beach or they're going to the mountains or they're doing something just to rest and relax. And you know what the problem is? You come back and you're still, you, 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 the same problems are still there. And here Jesus is giving the invitation. I will uh, uh, <clears throat> show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythm, rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. The invitation of Jesus right here is to a burden-free life. Christianity is not something which we should be working hard at. It will call, the grace of God causes us to labor more abundantly. But if grace isn't causing you to labor more abundantly, if you're just laboring more abundantly because... Um, <clears throat> you feel it's the right thing to do or because it's the right thing to do, you're going to burn out. Now, in context, Jesus is speaking to religious Jews and he's saying, stop trying to please God through your efforts. Are you trying to please God through your efforts? You need to rest. You need to enter his rest, which is salvation. Salvation is a matter of entering into rest where we're not striving to be accepted by God, to please God, to work. We're not working for God. We're resting in his work. Amen. We're resting in the finished work, what Jesus has done for us. 
And yet, it can be so subtle that we're not enjoying the fullness of what Jesus has for us because we're holding on to a ritual to try and get closer to God. We're holding on to some religious observance, thinking that this has power to, to connect me to God. I know many of us, many of I did it for years, and so I can call it out because I know it. We, we hold on to communion, Holy Communion, and we think that this is bringing us closer to God. Holy Communion doesn't bring you closer to God. We, we, we hold on to anointing oil, and we think this anointing oil is going to bring us closer to God. It's not going to bring you closer to God. We, we hold on to worship. I love worship, but we hold on to worship. And, and worshiping and singing to Jesus and all this. And we think this is bringing us closer to God. No, it's not. You might think that giving, tithing, sowing, reaping, whatever. This is going to bring you closer to God. No, it's not. Did you know that many Christians are living way below what God has provided for us? Because they are trying to get closer to God. When in reality, you are as close to God as you will ever be. You cannot get closer to God than you already are. In fact, you are one with Him. We're not really getting to Hebrews chapter 10 yet. But I believe this is a word that, that many of us need to hear this evening. Many of us need to be encouraged in this. 1 Corinthians 6.17 says, But he who is joined unto the Lord is one spirit with him. One spirit. That word one means, in the Greek it's H-E-I-S, hes. It means one to the exclusion of any other. So this is saying, when we believed and we became Christians, we became one spirit with the Lord. It's not two becoming one. It's not sticking two pieces of paper together. Okay? Yeah, I can glue two pieces of paper together and you can maybe steam it apart, but you can still maybe even see that it's two pieces of paper that are separate. Two becoming one here is talking about like taking two coins and melting them together so that you cannot separate them to, to be in their separate entities again. Because there's no longer two separate entities. They are one. Okay, and this is what's happened to us when we became Christians. We became one with the Lord, never to be separated again. And yet you have a lot of Christians who, because of ignorance, are running around going, Oh, you know, I need, I've broken fellowship with God because I've sinned and I need to, to repent and I need to get God to forgive me so that I can have relationship with again, Him again. Because, oh, you know, we, we, we say stupid prayers and we sing stupid songs like, um, Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. We're quoting David from the Old Testament. Friends, that is, is, is not the Christian life. I understand if you make a mistake, you need to repent. You need to change your thinking. That's what repent means. It doesn't mean change your actions. Repent is talking about changing your thinking. Because your stinking thinking has uh, caused you to have a terrible actions. Caused you to have a, a bad situation. And so change your stinking thinking so it changes your actions. As a man thinks in his heart, so, so is he. So change your thinking and you change your life. That's repentance. And yet religion comes in and says, repent, stop sinning. Repentance isn't stop sinning. Repentance is start believing the gospel. There's a verse for that. Let's look at Mark <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus speaking, he says, the time is fulfilled and God's uh, and the, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. This is, this is what we're called to, is repent and believe the gospel. Change your thinking. Stop believing what you've believed and start believing the good news of what Jesus has done for you and freely offers you. Because that's what's going to change your life. You're as close to God as you'll ever be. You're as close to God as you'll ever be. But pastor, I haven't tithed this month. You're still as close to God as you'll ever be. 
But pastor, I, I haven't uh, been praying like I should. I haven't been spending time with him because I sinned and I feel ashamed. You're still as close to God as you'll ever be. Someone caught up in a sin and trapped in a sin. You know, the answer for them isn't to be sorry about the sin that they're stuck in. The answer is that they start believing what Jesus has done for them. If you, in your situation, in the mess that you're stuck in, just start to see Jesus and you just start to believe what he says about you, that you are righteous, it'll change your life completely. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. When you stop focusing in on the problem that you're living in, the problems that are coming against you, and you start focusing on Christ in you, your hope of glory, things will start to change. Things will start to get better and improve. But as Christians, we need to be living from this reality. We hold on to too many shadows. Okay, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1, we got there. Amen. The law was a shadow of the good things to come. The law was a shadow of the good things to come. Now you can see a shadow here. Okay, uh, let me try and get it there. You can see my hand is reflected from the light, uh, or uh, is, is blocking the light and causing a shadow on me. Now, it, you, 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 the shadow isn't the reality. My hand is the reality. Okay, so if I was walking around a corner and the sun came from behind me and you saw my shadow and you identified, that's Pastor Shane. And you saw it and you were like, that's Shane. Do you run up to the shadow and embrace the shadow and hug the shadow and live in the shadow? No, no, no. You turn around the corner and you see the reality. So the law was a shadow. The law was a shadow pointing towards a reality and the reality was Christ, is Christ. So we don't embrace, embrace, embrace the shadow. We embrace the reality, which is Jesus. Okay, Jesus is the reality of the shadow. Now, it's important for us to, to look into this a bit more. And we won't get into it right now, but uh, completely. But Colossians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 16 to 17. New King James Version says, So, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon, or Sabbath, <coughs> which are shadows <coughs> of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. The Living Bible puts it beautifully. Don't let anyone criticize you for what you eat or drink. Or for not celebrating Jewish holidays. The holidays prescribed and described in the Old Testament. Or the feasts. Or the new moon ceremonies. Or Sabbaths. For all of these were temporary Rules that ended when Christ came. They were only shadows of the real thing of Christ himself. So Old Testament law, rituals, uh, 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 the feasts, everything points to the reality, which is Jesus. I'm going to describe a couple things very simply, maybe even just one. But for example, the Last Supper. Uh, 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 the Last Supper was um, Jesus, if you go and read it, he was celebrating the Passover meal. The Passover meal was established uh, 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 in Exodus. Okay, so the, the Jews celebrated it for many years. Okay, what were they celebrating? What were the Jews celebrating when they celebrated the Passover meal? What were they celebrating? They were celebrating their exodus from Egypt into the promised land. But it was a foreshadow. Remember, the law was a shadow of the good things to come. So it was a foreshadow of redemption. It was a foreshadow of redemption. And so now <clears throat> you have um, uh, 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 the, them coming out of bondage. Going through the Red Sea, which is a picture of our baptism into Christ. They're going through the, 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 the Red Sea, which is like a baptism. The waters open up and they walk through the waters. <clears throat> and they come out on the other side into freedom. Uh, <clears throat> and there's so many pictures in there. But the whole picture is a picture. It's a story of redemption. And yet today, you have Christians 
trying to celebrate Jewish feasts like Passover. When this, this verse even says, don't let anyone criticize you for not celebrating Jewish feasts. Why? Because it was a shadow and we now have the reality which is Christ. As Christians, if we want to live in the fullness of the abundant life and everything that Jesus has got for us, we've got to let go of shadows and we've got to embrace reality. We've got to let go of rituals and we've got to embrace the reality of Jesus. Jesus is a living person. You're one with him. He lives in you. And you need to enjoy intimacy and relationship with him. And as you do, It'll cause a fruitfulness in your life that you could not imagine. It'll exceed your wildest expectations. But as long as you're holding on to rituals to try and get closer to Him, you'll never experience the fullness of Him. What are rituals? A ritual is anything that you do to try and connect with Jesus. Now there's some things which are good, like praying is connecting with Jesus. Worship is connecting with Jesus. Yeah, for example... But it's, it, it all comes back to the heart, doesn't it? Ultimately, worship is a moment for us to enjoy our connection with Jesus. It doesn't get us closer to Him. Worship is a moment to enjoy our, our union with Christ. Uh, a prayer is a moment to enjoy our union with Christ. Okay? It doesn't get us closer to Him. It, be reading the Bible, studying the Bible is a moment to discover more about our relationship with Him so I can enjoy more of my relationship with Him. But it doesn't cause me to get closer to Him. It might cause me to experience more intimacy with Him. Amen? It's so important that we see this. We cannot get closer to God than we already are. We need to discover how close we are to Him and then just learn to live in the fullness of that intimacy with Him. And as we do that, we would experience the reality of Christianity like Jesus intended, like God intended. Amen? If we're trying to do anything to connect with God, if we're putting anything in between us and God, and using that to try and um, <clears throat> get closer to Him, it's almost an idol. It's, it, it, what is it that ultimately has connected us to God? It's His Spirit that's come to now live inside of us because of Jesus and because his spirit lives inside of us we are con as connected to him as we will ever be we need to awaken to that reality and live in the fullness of it amen there is no separation between you and God even if you're at your lowest point right now there is no separation you just need to change your thinking and put your focus in the right place until next time, be encouraged in the salvation truth that you are one with God. You are full with His presence. You are full of His love. You are full of His power. And you are blessed.